I'm going to get give everybody uh, the minute to 11:15 uh, to come back in. And for CPAC members, if you can turn on your camera so that I know you are back with us, thank you. All right, let me go ahead. I hope that uh, comes Jason back and seeing just about everybody back with their cameras now. So good. Um, obviously, I want to start by thanking the folks who made public comments. And, and Sam, hope you're back with us. That was um, very, very helpful for the panel and for everybody to hear. And um, I know that uh, folks have benefited from your, from your input throughout the course of the review. Um, does anyone from CPAC we have since we're starting back after this break? Did anybody have a, a question or comment they wanted to make after Sam's um, uh, public comment? I, I do. I, and uh, first of all, Sam, thank you. That was uh, very brave, and and I loved your quote. I I think I'm going to use it uh, about being sick and tired of being sick and tired. I think it was incredibly powerful. Um, the other overarching comment I wanted to make in regard to that is that. Um, of all the data that's been collected and that we've reviewed, I just want everybody to be cognizant of the fact that almost none of it is in children. You know, we have no data even that's in clinical trials yet for the great majority of uh, drugs in anybody less than 12. Um, these drugs are probably going to, I think, have the greatest impact on, you know, early, early treatment and maybe the impact on the natural history of the disease. So that's something that we have to leave to the future. And if we don't have these drugs open to us to move down into children, we're never going to have that information. And then finally, and this is directly related to Sam's comments, is that much more important even than the drugs that we have available to us is education of the clinician providers that are taking care of these patients. This is a really complex disease and uh, I think it's by and large managed not even by physicians but mostly by um, uh, 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 non-physician providers and a lot in urgent care centers, a lot in emergency rooms and education of the clinicians is what's really foremost important to be able to provide the optimal care and optimal use of any of these medicines. Great. Well, thank you, Elaine. And again, we are going to um, have the privilege of having you on the policy roundtable where we'll pick up um, a lot of those. We are, we are still um, mired, if you will, in the evidence as we start to think about the votes. But again, I think Don had a question or a comment he wanted to make before we jump to that. Don? Yes, yes thank you. I, I First of all, I would like to say to Sam, uh, as the person on the CPAC voting panel today, because I'm the parent of a young woman about your age with a different chronic Ill illness, I just want to thank you for the remarkably powerful lucidity uh, 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 and just uh, just compelling nature of the testimony you've given. It, it, it just is extremely moving. And I just want to tell you that as a 22 year old person, you have many, many decades ahead of you to cure atopic dermatitis. So you, you needn't castigate yourself for not having done that yet. I, I want to ask you a question though, if you don't mind. And it is, I was listening to Dr. Rind ask the uh, representatives of the pharmaceutical companies uh, about the fact that the FDA is apparently very anxious about these jack inhibitors in other contexts and that sort of looms over this analysis here even though in the four corners of the evidence that we're considering there's really nothing that suggests that there are any of these other outcomes that the FDA seems to be worrying about uh, and then there's some notion here that really ultimately this is a choice for patients to make in consultation with their uh, physicians so I, I'd like to, you to tell me what you would do um, knowing that the FDA has this, from our perspective, undifferentiated or unarticulated anxiety about possible side effects for these things, if your doctor were to offer you one of these drugs today, what would you say? Would you say, Yahoo, write the prescription, let's do it? So that's a bit of a complicated question, and I'll try to answer it to the best of my abilities, but currently I actually don't have a treatment plan. I'll be honest, um, I'm suffering every day with chronic to severe AD because all of my previous treatments stopped working. 
So if it was offered to me, I would, I'd be open to the possibility, but admittedly I'd be hesitant only because after trying so many treatments, you end up with some trust issues where something sometimes sounds almost too good to be true. Where, uh, for example, when I was on immunosuppressants, I was sitting there going, okay, these side effects sound a little scary and they ended up being scary. And I ended up with staph infections. And I actually remember there was one time my, uh, it could have been my enzyme level for my liver came back a little, uh, I'm gonna say wonky, but it wasn't where they were supposed to be. And I went home crying going, I, what did I just do? What did I just do to my body? Uh, no parts of this treatment were worth this. It was not worth this. So after dealing with treatments like that, you get a little scared. But for somebody who is not as, I'm gonna say experienced with AD, as in they're not 24, they're just starting out trying to find treatments, they could be very interested in this. This could be a great treatment option for them but every eczema patient's different. So for someone like me, I may be hesitant because of trust issues, but for someone who is just starting out, this could be great if they have chronic to severe AD. So you never really know, but I would be interested in it. I just may be a little bit hesitant. Thank you. That's going to be really helpful to me as I vote. I really appreciate what an effective patient ambassador you are. All right, thanks. Okay, why don't we go ahead to the first voting slide. Um, it will help kind of frame again how we're going to have to think through things again. And this is where we have more time for discussion about the evidence, obviously, before we, we would take a vote. Um, we advance to the next slide. Okay, so we have a variety of voting questions. And again, what's coming first are the what we usually call the clinical effectiveness voting questions, followed by the potential other benefits and contextual considerations and then the value vote. And for the first four questions, <clears throat> the patient population is adults with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis whose disease has either not responded adequately to topical therapies or for whom topical therapies have not been tolerated or are medically inadvisable. Usual care in uh, such patients is defined as use of topical emollients and avoidance of exacerbating factors. So that's the patient population we are now going to vote on uh, several different agents. The first is going to be abrocitinib. Now, again, I'll read, you've heard the patient population. We didn't wanna put that on every slide just because it makes the slides way too kind of busy. So keep that patient population in mind. Adult patients, moderate to severe um, topicals have not worked or not indicated. Given the currently available evidence, is it adequate to demonstrate that the net health benefit of abrocitinib added to usual care is superior to that provided by usual care alone. I stress the word currently because obviously we've been hearing and we'll talk more about the issues of uh, the uncertainty around the safety profiles. Um, but let me go ahead and just invite Steve Atlas again to summarize very briefly the key data, um, highlight the tables and the evidence summary where it can be found, and again, briefly summarize the ICER team's rationale behind its evidence rating as we head into this vote. Steve? Sure, so just to remember, this was a uh, PI, a promising but inconclusive rating for abrocitinib. Um, probably the table in the evidence summary we provided that can be most helpful is table five, which shows the easy responses for the different drugs. For abrocitinib, uh, particularly at the higher doses, compared to placebo to usual care, uh, there was a considerable benefit of the medication across all of the different outcomes. Um, uh, and in that sense, they were consistent. As mentioned, the side effects reported in the trials um, were infrequent and there weren't serious ones reported. But again, we've spent um, a lot of time talking about the um, potential risk of the oral JAK class uh, and the black box warnings for other indications, leading us to say that this um, appears to be a very effective treatment compared to usual care, um, but there are safety concerns that remain unanswered at the present time. All right, and since the safety concerns are gonna be 
somewhat generalized across the class. Um, feel free, we'll spend some time on that to the extent that you guys want to ask questions and discuss it um, around this vote. And we may not need to delve into it quite the same, obviously, when we talk about the, the other Jack voters. Um, Robert, go ahead. Uh, so Steve, could you just clarify, is dupilumab a part of the usual care that we're looking at here? It is not. No. It is not. Okay. No, it's not. Yeah. Anybody else want to ask a further question about either the effectiveness or the safety? We have also, we continue to have uh, Sam and, and Wendy, uh, patient experts as well. Uh, they're two clinical experts, so feel free to reflect questions to them if you'd like. Left arrow. Yes, uh, going back to to the risk, uh, is there a time frame that uh, we uh, of the clinical trials, and how does is that compared to the time frame of potential risks? If if a trial, for example, is for one month and the risk is expected to start in six months, then the information that we have is completely unhelpful. But uh, how does it overlap? Thank you. Steve? I think the, you know, the, sh the pivotal trials are 16 week trials. So uh, four months. There are ongo as, um, as mentioned, there are ongoing longer term trials. You know, the, uh, the issue is that these are rare events or uncommon events. And the issue is, is even with longer term follow-up, given the number of patients being studied uh, and the nature of patients participating in clinical trials, will this mirror the population that um, our experts um, will be treating when this drug becomes approved? And in that sense, from a clinical standpoint, there's not just the need for longer follow-up, there needs to be more patients followed for these uncommon events. Um, and the uh, patients that Dr. Silverberg um, is going to consider treating. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to add to that? Sure. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't say anything previously, some of the discussion points, but I think there, there's a lot, there's a lot here. Um, you know, just to put it into context, uh, for the JAK inhibitors in terms of, of safety, you know, we're, we're talking about um, incredibly effective drugs. I, I, and just, you have to see them in action to appreciate just how impressive they are in clinical practice. These are drugs that are shutting down some of the most severe disease in patients that previously failed everything. Number needed to treat of like less than two for some outcome measures. And in many cases, the onset of efficacy is like a light switch. It's so quick. Um, in patients who've had it for years and failed everything, including dupilumab. Uh, you know, and in contrast, the FDA's concerns around some of these rare events, venous thromboembolism, MACE, et cetera, these are much rarer events with incidence rates around 0.1 to 0.4 per 100 patient years, maybe even less. And I don't try to minimize those concerns, but in medicine, we understand that, you know, medications can come with risk. And I think this is part of shared decision-making. And as um, Samantha mentioned, you know, th this is this is every patient will be different in terms of how they deal with this. Um, the we have not seen cumulative risk per se across the open because we, in addition to what Steve mentioned, we have unblinded open label extension data pushing out now for much longer periods of time. We don't really see increases in the event rates. Actually, we see decreases. Just whoever's getting it often gets it early on in terms of these events. Uh, and I think the other thing is that one of the, the big challenges altogether of this entire exercise, and I've, I've had this conversation openly with the ICER folks, is that, you know, that we don't anticipate that uh, these drugs will be used in highest doses continuously in the majority of patients. We expect that there's going to be dose flexibility, down titration being used, similar to the, if you're not familiar, there's a study called the Jade Regimen study used for abracitinib where patients are sort of down titrated when they can be in order to try to potentially minimize risk. And I think that has massive implications even on the, the cost effectiveness, but certainly on the safety issues. Uh, so I, I'm not, you know, I think these are real events. I think they will be true across the class. I think they'll be less common than what we saw with tofacitinib, but I also don't see that 
you know, clinically as an obstacle, it, it's something that needs to be factored into the clinical decision making. But I, I don't think we can look at the efficacy and question that. I mean, the, and so um, I, I don't know, and we don't have models in medicine that really know how to contextualize massively effective drugs versus rarely dangerous drugs. And I'm not trying to oversimplify, but that's sort of how I think about it. Um, so, you know, but these events, they're real and we'll have to be careful in our patient selection. Um, but these are patients who also have literally nothing else to go to. And so if we turn them away from these drugs and we deny them access, uh, we're literally dooming them for the next decade until the next generation of drugs comes out. Thanks. Uh, just one quick comment, um, because it, it, it's, I know it's hard to disentangle them, but um, the, the question is, is both, it's about net health benefit, which means that we do ask the CPAC panel to try to do that difficult weighing of the evidence on effectiveness and uh, safety. And also we are not passing judgment with these questions specifically on whether the drug should or shouldn't be covered. That's in some ways a broader question, a slightly different question. This is obviously a core component of it, but uh, we're not making recommendations for coverage with these kinds of uh, questions. Um, David Rind or anybody else on the ICER staff who, who've also been thinking about this the unknown unknowns given the FDA's actions. Is there anything else you would want to say to give context to this question? Um, I, I guess what I would say is I, I think Dr. Silverberg's right. Um, these drugs work really well. And my nervousness about this, as, as I've said earlier, is just heightened by whatever is going on with the FDA. The FDA is even more nervous, and I'm pretty nervous about new drugs, but the FDA appears to be even more nervous than I am, and I'm just noticing that. All right, and just to, just to be clear, so there's publicly available data on the risks of tofacitinib in longer term use that are known and that people have been talking about, but the FDA are looking at data that are not known to anybody but FDA and the manufacturer. Is that correct? <clears throat> Is that what we're assuming? I think we're not sure. I, okay. you know, we, we know that they've put holds on this and I, I, don't, I at least feel like we don't perfectly understand what's going on. Okay. I, I would just add for context also, right. these drugs are approved already for atopic dermatitis in Japan and in Europe and have mustered, uh, you know, credibility or, or uh, you know, sufficient demonstration of net health benefit. And I think that is an important uh, consideration. FDA has its own internal process and in how they deal with things. We know historically in atopic dermatitis, uh, they tend to underappreciate the severity of the disease. Um, they have assigned a black box warning um, to Protopic 15 years ago. Uh, 15 years later and tens of millions of dollars invested in post-marketing research studies, we found no real safety demonstration of concerns, yet there's still a theoretical black box warning that persists. So FDA is FDA, but I'm not sure that that is really any, you know, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And I, and I think it also needs to be clear, the FDA has not put holds on anything. They have not put warnings or holds on anything. That is an inappropriate terminology. They have been delayed. They were also delayed on trilokinumab, not because of any safety concerns, but because they, they some technical nonsense around the syringe. So we have, um, uh, you know, these delays, I don't, you know, yes, there's because they want to review data. I'm not suggesting that it's not related to some of the safety concerns, but that's not the same thing as a whole. Uh, it is more of they need more time to query and have confidence in their decisions. Steve Pearson, just the one other thing that I would just add for the group is um, Aversitinib, as opposed to the other oral jacks, has not yet been approved in the U.S. for any uh, indication. So, uh, um, so that so um, Dr. Silverberg is commenting on its use outside of the U.S., but it has not yet been approved for in for use in the U.S. for any indication. And, and to clarify, Aver is not approved in Europe and Japan either. It's it's Baricitinib that is. Um, 
and uh, and we have trilokinumab is also approved in Germany, right? So it depends on the drug. They're in different stages, but um, at least for a number of these, they do have approvals outside the U.S. All right. So let's go ahead and take this vote. Uh, I have to watch the clock a bit just in terms of making sure we have ample time to discuss and vote on some of the other questions. Um, I think that was a good discussion. I'm seeing no more hands. So please go ahead and vote. We should have 13, so we have one more. There we go, great, please show the results. Okay, there we go. So eight yes and five no, all right. Let's move forward to the next question, which is about baricitinib. Steve, again, just um, briefly, you've told them table five, anything else in terms of context around either the effectiveness or safety of this JAK inhibitor that you'd like to point out? Um, just a couple of comments. So number one, baricitinib is approved uh, uh, in the US for other indications. Um, the uh, data in table five um, highlight that this is probably um, the weakest effect um, um, among the oral jacks um, that we've studied. Um, the one milligram doses um, um, uh, may be similar to placebo and, um, and probably will not be the primary dose. The two milligram dose is the one that is probably more relevant. Um, it does show benefit um, across multiple measures compared to um, uh, placebo. The magnitude of the benefit is uh, definitely at the bottom of the scale of these different drugs. And the safety concerns are just the ones um, that we've been talking about and were highlighted by Dr. Silverberg. All right, thanks. Any questions from CPAC? Okay, let's go ahead and vote on this one. So this is baricitinib. Okay, show the results, please. All right, seven yes and six no. All right, moving to the next, it is upadacitinib. Eight, anything? Um, so upadacitinib should be considered in a more comparable fashion to uh, abracitinib. Um, it, at the highest dose, appears to be um, the most efficacious or very comparable to the highest dose of abracitinib. Uh, it is approved for other indications in the US for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the um, safety profile appears to be comparable to the other oral JAK inhibitors and all of the issues that we've highlighted regarding the class effect um, pertain to this drug as well. All right, any questions, comments? All right, please go ahead and vote on upadacitinib. All right, please show the results. Nine yes and four no. All right, one more in this set, which is trelokinumab. Uh, now we're not in the jack inhibitors, obviously. So Steve, why don't you give some brief reminders on what the evidence was on trelokinumab? Right, so um, trelokinumab is not an oral jack inhibitor. It's an IL-13. Uh, uh, ag antagonist, it is more comparable or it has a more similar or potentially more similar to mode of action to dupilumab. It's given by injection. In terms of the outcomes reported that are, as an example in table five, again, this appears to be a somewhat less effective than the higher doses of the uh, oral JAK inhibitors. Um, the PI rating for this is a different one 
than for um, the oral JAK inhibitors. We don't, we are not as concerned in terms of the safety profile of trilokinumab in terms of its class effect because it isn't an oral JAK inhibitor. The PI rating for this um, reflects two things. One is that it's somewhat less effective uh, than some of the other agents that we've discussed. Um, and while it appears to be a safe agent um, and may be similar uh, uh, in mechanism to dupilumab, it doesn't have the same long-term safety data um, that dupilumab has. It also um, it, it has the same sort of long-term um, questions as um, all of these newer drugs. Um, but so it's a different um, uh, concern for the PI rating. Uh, David, does that reflect, um, do you have any other comments in terms of the trilokinumab? Yeah, I, I think this was hard for us to figure out how to rate. Um, you could, we, we gave dupilumab several years ago a B plus rating. It was more effective than trilokinumab but you could have imagined similar concerns about safety. And our sense was that the need for an effective drug for atopic, for you know, severe atopic dermatitis was such that it was going to overwhelm the safety concerns. Trelo isn't quite as effective. Um, and I think that the choice between giving this a PI rating and a B plus rating was a close call. And it also would ratings, evidence ratings are shorthand. And it would have been tricky for someone trying to understand our report, what a B plus rating meant on trail of Kinemab with PI ratings on the jacks given how much more effective the UPA and ABRO are than trelokinumab. So I want the panel to have that context, to think, remember that evidence ratings are a shorthand as you vote on this, because it's a shorthand. Can I just add one minor, or maybe not so minor point? Um, so the panel was also presented with somewhat, well, partial, incomplete data for not just this drug, but for all the drugs, in the sense that the modeling was set at uh, you know consistent time points, um, we actually have data for trilokinumab that moves beyond that shows a gain of of uh, efficacy, and that um, if you push out an extra two months, you get to efficacy comparable to dupilumab. And so we may just be talking about something a little bit slower, but not less effective if you go out to a longer time horizon. So I think it's important to, to be careful, especially when you're dealing with a biologic and injectable therapy that's going to be a long-term therapy, not to judge by the short-term time points. That may be a very different conversation than the JAK inhibitors, which plateau in their efficacy sooner. Dr. Silverberg, sorry, those data, are they in the public domain? The longer-term sure. data? Yeah, no, they have, uh, they have data pushing out week 36, week 52. Um, but again, it's Every study is a little different in their design. So from a modeling standpoint, when you're trying to come up with this very oversimplification of this body of data for this exercise, you can't take everything into account, but the data clearly show a gain of efficacy over time. Okay. I just wanna let the ICER research team, I mean, this isn't related to the economic model. This is more just on their understanding of the body of evidence. Correct. Can you? Correct. So Stephen, David, you guys were aware of that longer term data on Trello? Um, you know, the, the data that um, we focused on was um, some issues with trilokinumab about whether the, um, as Dr. Silverberg said before, about sort of the potential for people who are responding to lower the dose and continue to show efficacy. So um, uh, for trilokinumab, there's people who've responded, they've talked about sort of um, decreasing the dose from every two weeks to every four weeks. Um, in terms of maintenance of therapy. Um, I think uh, so, and that shows some um, benefit of that type of uh, lowering dose, though the effectiveness decreases. It is uh, correct that the um, 
that the biologics are of slower onset. Um, and, um, uh, you know, that we haven't highlighted as much the time of onset, um, particularly for some of the um, uh, jock inhibitors is a potential benefit is that they do work quicker. Okay. Um, All right. Can I just ask, I, I just wanted to ask Dr. Silverberg because, it, and I don't want to pretend that I know these data as well as Steve Atlas does, but do we have longer term randomized versus placebo data for Trello out to those dates where we see it increasing and, and separating more from placebo? Or is it that as Dr. Atlas was describing, and I know those data, that we have data on what happens if you stick with the every two week dosing or go to every four week dosing? Um, for Trello Kinumab, uh... I'm trying to recall. I don't. I don't think those data are blinded, and okay. even even if they were, they would be technically nuanced, a different study design than let's say what we saw done in the upadacitinib studies or abracitinib studies or baricitinib studies. So there's a reason why it makes it very hard to compare apples to apples. We do provide in the report some data on chalokinumab for longer periods of time. For the reasons that Dr. Silverberg highlights, we're not able to um, compare them in a way to, to in fact say whether the, this longer term benefit does in fact mirror dupilumab or not based upon the nature of the um, outcomes assessed and how the trials are um, done. Got it. Thank you, thank you both. All right, seeing no other questions from CPAC, let's take this vote on net health benefit of trilokinumab versus usual care alone. Okay, and show the results. All right, 11 yes and two no. All right, thank you. Now we're moving to one final comparative clinical effectiveness question. Um, and this is a different patient population. This is around the evidence on both adolescents and adults with mild to moderate atopic dermatitis. And for this patient population, we have one drug um, to ask you about, it is ruxolitinib. So given the currently available evidence, is it adequate to demonstrate the net health benefit of rexolitinib is superior to that provided by topical emollients alone. Steve, you want to point out the, diff, uh, the evidence on that again? Oops, you're still muted, Steve. Excuse me. Um, yes, in the uh, evidence summary, um, these um, are really the evidence um, that's most relevant is table 12. Um, the uh, two pivotal randomized controlled trials uh, for ruxolitinib at uh, two doses um, showing a benefit that is um, a dose effect response compared to placebo showing um, considerable benefit in terms of all of the different pr uh, primary and secondary outcome measures over a eight week primary outcome uh, time period. Um, as we've discussed, the um, side effect profile for, um, for ruxolitinib cream looks very good. Um, and in fact, in longer term trials, um, placebo has reports more discontinuation than the cream. We've also highlighted to a great uh, extent the, um, that this is a JAK inhibitor. And though um, the uh, systemic doses would be considerably uh, less for the topical, uh, there is uh, some systemic absorption. Um, this, the issues around safety for the topical um, uh, would, would be less than what we've been considering for the oral jacket inhibitors and that Dr. Silverberg has highlighted. Um, um, and as we've discussed as a class effect, 
the FDA has delayed consideration for reluxamitinib cream as well. Right. Okay, we have several questions. Steve, go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, and I noted in the report as well, um, you know, this issue of systemic absorption um, being lessened perhaps was, um, you know, a plus. Um, but my understanding is that many of the forms of cancer of concern among the JAK inhibitors were skin cancers. And so I'm wondering if topical use um, wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, diminish the result, the, the risk of those skin cancers. Um, and perhaps if the expert has an opinion on that. Uh, Dr. Sieber, Secretor, Dr. Silver, do you want to comment on that? We don't know. And it's a good question. Uh, how much of that, you know, non-melanoma uh, skin cancer signal is related to, um, you know, some more of a systemic immunosuppression effect uh, or, you know, direct tissue effect. Um, the, uh, I'm not sure if we have any data really to, to fully shed light on that. I mean, I'm not, uh, it's obviously going to be very different in terms of, you know, you're talking about basal cells in, in particular and, and squamous cell carcinomas. We're not talking about melanomas, fortunately, uh, which puts it, I think, into a little more context. And obviously, this is going to be less of an issue in the pediatric realm because fortunately, we don't see non-melanoma skin cancer in kids. Uh, but it is something that will come up in the adults. Um, you, you know, the when we whenever we have patients on systemic immunosuppressants, we do generally recommend in the world of dermatology to have more frequent skin checks. Um, and we don't feel like um, that's something that we cannot handle clinically. In general, most dermatologists will say, well, okay, you know, this is what we do, right? We screen for skin cancers. We can monitor that very easily. That's very different level of concern uh, than when you're talking about, let's say, VTE or MACE. Um, but, but we don't necessarily know. We, we certainly use topical steroids, topical calcineurin inhibitors, which are broadly immunosuppressing um, on the skin, and we don't see those signals. So I, I can say it's an educated guess, but it is a guess that likely topical will not have the same effect that systemic does. All right, thanks. Austin. Yeah, I, I just want to make really sure that I'm making the right comparison. Um, looking at table two, I think what we've just discussed in table, whatever it was down below, 12 or whatever it was, is, is, is corresponding to the placebo line on this table, which says C++ comparable or better, yes? Then there's the topical therapies line. And I wanna make sure I'm not confused about topical emoluments with topical therapies. Can, we, can you just get that all straight for me? Yes, thank you for asking. Um, so first, this is a C++ rating, which is comparable or better with the benefit that we've highlighted and the, uh, the low uncertainties that we've discussed. In terms of the comparator, when we're talking about topical emollients, we're talking about um, um, non-prescription medications. We're talking about moisturizers, um, non-prescription uh, ones. So this is not, this is, would be the equivalent of the vehicle or placebo comparison. Thank you. Great. All right, any other questions about uh, rexolitinib? All right, let's go ahead and take your votes, please. All right, we can show the results. 12 yes and one no, all right. Okay, excellent work. Now we're moving into the questions that are sometimes a little bit more challenging because they ask us to step back and look at the context and some broader potential other benefits or disadvantages. If we go to the next slide. Okay, I'm gonna read this uh, again out loud. The, the question is framed, when making judgments of overall long-term value for money, what's the relative priority that should be given to any effective treatment for atopic dermatitis on the basis of the following contextual considerations? The first is the acuity of need for treatment based on the severity of the condition being treated. Now, I know uh, you've heard about the 
variation in how patients experience uh, atopic dermatitis. Um, here, I would say we are not talking about mild. We should be considering this to be the moderate to severe spectrum of the condition that we're asking about here. And based on the acuity of need, based on its severity, um, that means, again, the severity means that we, for some conditions like a fatal cancer, you have very little time left. So there's a high acuity of need based on the severity of that kind of situation. Um, and the question is, where does this fit on that spectrum? Should any effective treatment be given relatively average priority? Or as you can see, we can give it lower priority or higher priority. Austin, do you have another question? We just had your hand up. Yeah, because it's been it's been a few years since I've been on the panel, so forgive me. I, I want some clarification. Um, any effective treatment? Are we to think about any effective new treatment or even ones yes. that currently exist? So you said uh, well, I mean, in a one. sense, you can think of either one, but it's okay. What we're talking about what what we should do with new treatments, given oh. the current unmet need and the current acuity of need for treatment for patients. Then I have a follow-up for clinicians. I, I don't have a sense, and forgive me if it was in the report, I, I didn't have much time to look at it. Um, uh, how, what proportion of patients are, they consider sort of failing on existing treatments? Um, um, you know, what's the need? I wanna get a better, a more data-driven sense of what the need is, that would help. Are you just asking like who's failed emollients previously or who's failed like previous topical steroids or approved options? Well, all the available options to date. Um... So by definition, if they're coming in to see us, um, you know, we, well, the, the guidelines typically will warrant a step up, at least US and Europe use a step up approach concept that, you know, everyone should be recommended conservative therapy emollients first. So for making that decision to go to a prescription therapy, by definition, those patients would have already either tried on their own or based on clinician guidance, failed um, emollients and uh, more conservative options. We still recommend them, but as monotherapy, they would be inadequate. For prescription therapy, um, you know, the mainstay right now is topical steroids. Um, varying potencies, different, you know, used in almost like artistry in different parts of the body with different potencies, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, the more severe the patient is, the more likely they are to fail existing topical therapy so that the bigger unmet need will be in the moderate patient than in the mild patient. Um, and also the more chronic and persistent the disease, even within mild disease, the more they're going to need a non-steroidal option because of concerns around safety. So the, the unmet needs are less, uh, well, there, there certainly are unmet needs where topical steroids aren't potent enough, but that's not really the big unmet need. The big unmet need is that even when they are potent enough, because of the concerns around topical steroids with you know, skin thinning, atrophy, uh, easy bruising, skin tears, possibly systemic absorption, acne, rosacea, a variety of other side effects that happen with topical steroids, we cannot continue them long-term. And so then for the long-term management of chronic patients, that's where the gap comes up. And so putting aside ruxolitinib per se, just conceptually, we have a desperate need for non-steroidal options that will you know, not have those safety concerns, could be used long-term. And then of course we would like it if they could be as effective or more effective than our current standard of care st steroids. Um, and then that in the context of ruxolitinib, I mean, we could, we could debate these points, but I think probably, you know, uh, my personal opinion would be that ruxolitinib does meet all those, you know, tick box or check boxes, but, um, but th that's really where the unmet need is. Thanks. Rebecca? Thank you very much, Steve. Just a, a, a quick point before we do this particular vote. I was very moved by Sam's um, comments today about being sick and tired of being sick and tired. And a, just a language reminder for all of us, I think is important now to be person-centered. Patients never fail treatment, treatments fail patients. So we should just have that in mind as we do this series of votes here now. Couldn't agree more. Here, here, okay. Um, actually, I know we haven't had a chance to hear from uh, Wendy um, yet or Sam in a while. And there'll be other questions that I think are highly driven by our understanding of the patient experience. Is there anything else you guys would like to add to uh, the panel's understanding before we vote on this question? 
I'll, uh, I have a few comments about steroidal creams. I know they were mentioned. And actually before that, I just wanna say thank you to everybody for your kind comments about everything that I said. I really appreciate everyone listening to me. I really do. But as far as steroids, I personally uh, couldn't use them for my eyelid eczema. And I mentioned before I have severe eyelid eczema and I actually have stents in my eyes from scar tissue built up from it. So steroidal creams never were able to help me there. I also have stretch marks from steroidal creams and I tried soaking and then putting them on. And I'll be honest, most of the people that I know that have eczema, steroid creams just, they don't work that well. They're effective, but it's not very effective. It's, I always use the comparison. It's like giving a guy who just got his leg caught off by a chainsaw a bandaid and being like, here you go, this will fix everything. No, it does very minimal to actually prevent itch and help anything for long-term, especially. So I'd just like to say that. All right, thanks. Wendy, if you are, yes, if you'd like to say anything, there'll be other opportunities, but please go ahead. Sure, thank you. I think I'll just echo some of the comments and, and also commend Sam for, for what she shared. Um, really, it comes back to what I think Dr. Siegfried said very early on in that, you know, atopic dermatitis is a spectrum. You know, we're talking about very discrete sort of mild, moderate, and severe, but a lot of patients have disease that waxes and wanes across those severities over their lifetime. And so the need to have something that can fit sort of a severity at a given point in time is going to be incredibly important. So the acuity of need, while we're talking about it um, based on very you know, unique severities and very discrete categories, it's something that a lot of patients experience in a very, in broad swings over their lifetime. And we have, you know, data from some previous meetings that we have shared that really shows that patients can go from severe all the way down to mild and then back up again, whether that's in a chronic form or even seasonal. So having options that can address a lot of these different types of need as we're thinking about it is going to be incredibly important. Yeah, we'll come back to that on the policy roundtable too. It is both clinically and from an insurance perspective, hard, hard, but necessary to figure out what to do when you've got patients who cycle through very different levels of severity um, through the course of their condition. So um, we'll come back to that for sure too. All right, let's go ahead and vote on this question. The acuity of need, again, we're voting on what relative priority, and that's hard because you have to think about priority given to other treatments, other conditions. What relative priority would we give to any effective treatment for atopic dermatitis on the basis of the acuity of need based on the severity of the condition? And so I will wait to see when we've got 13 votes. Okay, we show the results. Okay, we've got six average, six high, and one very high. Okay, great. If we go to the next, um, next question, it's the same setup, any effective treatment, but it, instead of the severity uh, linked to the acuity of the need, this is more about the magnitude of the lifetime impact. Um, and some people think that these overlap. Sometimes they do, sometimes they're somewhat different. So we wanna ask about both. So here the question is, is there, what, right, what relative priority would we give to any effective treatment in this area based on the magnitude of the lifetime impact on individual patients of the condition being treated? Again, Sam, you've done a spectacular job of helping us all understand its effects for you. And, and also I know many other patients. Um, Elaine, I, you haven't had a chance either for a chance. I'm trying, this is so much easier when we're in person, but I can't see everybody. But I wanted to offer if Dr. Friedberg, uh, sorry, Siegfried wanted to jump in and if you had anything to say, because you, I know, care for patients over a long time span in their, their lives. What would you say about the magnitude of the lifetime impact for people? Well, I, I just want to underscore that this condition is incredibly common. You know, the, the, the statistics are anywhere from, you know, sort of 10 to 20 percent of children are impacted by this. And in, in the past, it's been overemphasized that, that it's self-limited for a population of kids, and it certainly is. But it's really the population of uh, children who have a lifetime, that they're facing a lifetime disease is still very high, you know, maybe two 
3% of the population, which is higher than all of psoriasis, for example. So when you're considering magnitude, you have to consider the numbers as well as the severity. And then of course the lifetime impact I think is, is, is really high. So the more options that we have to try to fit uh, our key into the, into the keyhole for every individual patient is really, is really important. And that's why I would urge people to, even though this isn't cancer and it's not life-threatening disease, it's really a life-altering disease. I often say it doesn't kill you, but it just ruins your life. And it's very, very common in the general population. So, you know, that's, that's my two cents worth on my opinion about the magnitude. Thank you very much. Uh, CPAC, any questions or comments you'd like to make before the vote? Okay. Is, is there something that I could say? Oh, real quick. yeah, we have, absolutely, please. I'm sorry. This is just something that I realized oh, I didn't sorry. mention in my speech. Um, for lifetime effects, uh, I know I mentioned that every decision that I make is dictated by my eczema. It's gotten to the point where uh, even having kids is something that is affected by this disease. So I would just like to mention that that's how much it impacts my life, that uh, personal relationships and having kids and choosing a career, those are all things that are dictated by this disease. All right, thank you. All right, okay, why don't you guys go ahead and take your votes, please. Again, on the magnitude of the lifetime impact with the relative priority for any effective treatment. From moderate to severe, atopic dermatitis. Looks like we need one more, no, that's it. Okay, we can show the results. All right, three average, nine high, and one very high. Okay, excellent. All right, moving to another set of questions. Here we're not talking about any effective treatment. We're actually now going to ask you to talk about the treatments we're looking at. <clears throat> and because we didn't really feel like we wanted to march through every single question for every single drug separately, we are going to ask you about the average effects of the new systemic therapies as a group. Now that's difficult. Um, we didn't ask you to try to distinguish them before, um, but this would include dupilumab. This would include all of the drugs that we're talking about today that are um, emerging or new. As a group, what are their relative effects versus usual care, which is just the use of topical emollients, on the following outcomes that also help inform judgments of the overall long-term value for money? So think of these as a group of new treatments, and we want to find out whether they have, if you will, broader effects um, on the following outcomes. So the next slide is the first of these is patients' ability to achieve their major life goals related to education, work, or family life. Sam, you have given us a dissertation on, on this from, uh, from your perspective, and it's been very, very helpful. Um, it's hard not to ask you if you want to add anything else to this because this is at the heart of much of what you've had to share with us. I, yeah, as I said, I, um, having kids is something that I, I can't even handle the thought of that. Just the possibility that I may hurt myself in the process because my body does not like internal change. When I hit puberty, my eczema became unmanageable. And even the idea of passing it down to my child and they're not having any treatment options, well, not any treatment options available, but the potential of not being able to treat, be treated properly because everyone reacts differently to treatment. So I can't handle that thought. Um, I cannot go into the career field that I originally wanted. I was called a liability uh, when I wanted to be a surgical tech. And it's my family life. My parents, I hear them crying at night because they can't help me. I have an older brother and the guilt that I feel is horrendous for putting this stress on my family. And I can assure you that a family dynamic is greatly affected and I'm forever grateful that I have the family that I do because I swear to you without them, I probably would have hurt myself. Okay, um, we're all really, uh, kind of moved by your personal experience with this condition. Um, so in thinking about, 
again, all of these new treatments, and we've heard about their relative benefits compared to emollients, um, what is their broader effect on patients' ability to achieve major life goals? Um, everything from a major negative to a major positive, as you can see. Does anybody else want to make a comment before the vote or question? Okay, let's go ahead and vote. All right, we have all the votes in. All right, so we've got, I'm going to take the prerogative of asking two people who, who asked major negative and minor negative. <clears throat> I think you may have been wondering whether we were asking whether the disease has this kind of effect. What we were asking is whether the treatments have an effect of, in, in a sense, a major positive effect on addressing the, the impact on patients' lives. So I'd like to take that vote again. Please, let's just scrub it. And if people could vote again, please. Okay. All right, you have four all right, minor positive and nine major positive. Thank you. All right, moving to the next question. This one is in the same framing. So we wanna know about the treatments as a group, their effect on caregivers' quality of life. And now we're doing a little bit of gymnastics because here we do want you to consider um, the adolescent population as a part of the bargain, if you will. Um, and we've heard again from Sam, some of the effects that it's had on her family. So we're not talking about whether the disease has a major negative effect. We're talking about whether the treatments as a group have a major, all the way, all the way from major negative effect all the way up to major positive effect. It's on caregivers. Um, anything else? Um, again, Sam has been so eloquent. Um, Wendy, your clinical experts, anything else you'd like to add to this? Well, let me, while you're thinking, let me ask um, Austin because he's got a question or a comment. Well, I, I think it may come through with their statements. I just think we haven't explored this. Uh, it would be good to explore this for a few minutes to, to give us a sense of, of what the uh, caregiver burdens are. So go ahead. Well, we can start with Sam again. Um, and then we can, if we want, we can have the clinical experts say more from their, from their experience. Sam, you've mentioned the effects on your personal family. I don't know if you want to say more if you've been in contact with other patients and have heard other stories about how it's affected their uh, family caregivers and, and what I guess we can focus on what the benefits of treatment for some people have been in terms of relieving a, a kind of a hardships for caregivers. What would you what would you say? So I do have quite a few friends who have chronic to severe eczema and I have spoken to their parents and our parents have spoken and there's a huge uh, indescribable burden on caregivers because they're making decisions for someone else, for their child. And when I was younger, I know that my mom always said that she felt like she was making the wrong decision constantly because we were seeing no improvement. And in, especially when I was an immunosuppressant, she's sitting there going, I don't know how to balance these side effects with what you're dealing with. Like, do I want you to be debilitated by your eczema or risk these side effects? I don't know. And then when we did find a treatment that was effective for me, there was just a huge shift in the whole family dynamic. There was less worries, there was less stress, anxiety, less breakdowns. We didn't have to be fearful if we left the house. Uh, we were never really able to go anywhere on vacation unless we, I had a, like a medical bag. I could leave the house to go grocery shopping and we didn't have to be fearful. So when I did have a treatment that was effective, it was just a huge shift for my brother, my parents, for my whole family. And that feeling was just, it was unfathomable because I didn't think I was ever going to get that. So when there is a treatment that's effective, it shifts the whole family's lives. My brother could go to school without getting, a, without being afraid that he was going to get a phone call that his sister was in the hospital. That's huge for him. And my parents are able to go to work with, again, without the fear that 
they were going to get a phone call that I was in the ER with a staph infection. It's incredible when you have a treatment that's effective. Okay, Dr. Harris, I'll get to you in a second. With the clinical experts, if, uh, you may not feel like you um, have uh, anything you'd like to add on to that, but if you do. I'd be happy to add on. I, I think, you know, the, the greatest body of, of evidence uh, about caregiver burden really lies in the pediatric realm, um, showing the impact on siblings and, and more importantly, on, I don't know, more importantly, but on the parents, um, you know, parents being unable to go to work, um, devoting uh, sometimes 20 hours or more a week towards topical skin regimen um, and the inability to be able to address almost anything else. There are whole scales something called the Family Dermatitis Impact Scale that was developed over 20 years ago because it is so well established that the impact that dermatitis, atopic dermatitis has uh, on the family. There, there really is a little less evidence in the adult realm. Um, there's less tools at least available for the adult realm. Uh, I see kids and adults, but I see more adults. We get this a lot, um, partners, spouses in the adult realm where you know if patient does not sleep, Nobody sleeps. Now, that's a saying that is said in the pediatric dermatology realm because this issue of co-sleeping, that the children will end up sleeping with the parents, the parents can't sleep at night, and the impact that it takes on them. They have chronic fatigue syndrome. There's a study just published in uh, JAMA Dermatology a few months ago on chronic fatigue in parents. Um, but it's true in the, um, in the spouses of adult patients as well. And sometimes the spouses are even worse off than the patients because the patient, after having this for so many years, when they itch and they scratch in their sleep, it's going to impact their sleep efficiency, but they're able to fall back asleep. But for the adult uh, you know, partner or spouse, when they get elbowed in the middle of their sleep because their partner has got a flare, they can't fall back asleep. And so sometimes they actually have worse sleep than the patients do. Um, but this is not just based on anecdotal experience. We have a wealth of literature showing this burden uh, on the caregivers. Um, but again, given the tools, much of the demonstration of efficacy or of effectiveness of therapeutics uh, in this realm would be limited more towards the pediatric side, just because that's where we have the PROs available. Great, thank you. Left Harris? No, the one thing I just wanted to mention- oh, Sorry, Len. Uh, I'll, you know, we didn't really we didn't really talk about this with the data. We certainly have data on quality of life for individuals and for caregivers. But you know, the, the great majority of data that we have, even after studies are done, even after drugs are FDA approved, is in adults. And and the bulk of this particular question is, as Jonathan mentioned, in you know parents of young children and uh, you know caregivers. So this is really important. We don't have very much data. It's a little outside of the realm of uh, what the whole focus of this meeting is, but I'm glad that you included it. Thank you. Left Eric? I'm sorry, if I can add just one other comment. Oh, one, okay. one piece of data that we do have, uh, it actually came out of a meeting that we did with the FDA back in 2019. It was called the More Than Skin Deep meeting about eczema. We asked caregivers to rate sort of their overall you know, the burden of, of managing eczema. Um, and while it was predominantly, as Dr. Silverberg said, pediatric, there were a number of adult patients in that as, or adult uh, caregivers in that as well. And they rated the impact of eczema on their life as if they were a sort of an adult patient managing eczema. The level was almost identical. And so to, to his point that was raised before, you know, the impacts on the patient are clearly very significant, but the impacts on caregivers, whether they be spouses and adults in the same household or caregivers of a child, or significant. All right, great. Thank you very much, all of you. Um, Lefteris. My question is, uh, uh, if the treatments are going to add some stress to the caregivers because they're going to increase the cost, especially for people who, are, who have no insurance, or they're going to feel that they were left out. And also, if the, the treatments are going to increase the cost, to have a parent make a decision about the treatment that uh, the FDA has questions about the risk. And that, of course, the FDA is not the end all, but uh, we all, uh, you know, the, the, the risks are uncertain. So as Sam said, it's very difficult to make a decision for somebody else, especially if that the person is, you know, a, a child. Uh, and, uh, and having to, to make a decision about the treatment with limited uh, data on the risk uh, 
could be stressful. Any thoughts about it? Let the clinical experts uh, respond to that, and then we'll probably want to move on fairly quickly to the other questions. But go ahead, Dr. Herbert. I think you know increasing stress from cost. There's already um, a major, major cost uh, to patients with atopic dermatitis. Um, actually, an incredibly high one on the order of thousands, if not sometimes tens of thousands of dollars, seeking out topical therapies over the counter, um, and that's just out of pocket expenses that has nothing to do with co-pays and, and actual resource utilization in the prescriber setting. So the net effect actually of a safe and effective therapy uh, that's covered is that it reduces out of pocket costs enormously in this disease. Now, you know, depending on how tiering works and everything else, that's where patient assistance programs can help a lot with this. That's gonna be more, I think, for the policy discussion than for this. Um, the stress in the decision is a fascinating one, and it does come up um, amongst family members. Uh, and I'll give you one anecdote of a five-year-old child who had such bad disease that he literally could not stand up straight without excre you know, experiencing excruciating pain from cracks in the skin. And the parents were conflicted. The father was on board with starting. In this case, it was dupilumab. The mother was not. And there was some family stress about it. But three months later, the child was a happy, smiling child who was able to live life again. And then all of a sudden, those family stressors dissipated. And they still had their conflicts about should they continue therapy or not, and that was a decision to be made. Um, but the net effect of a safe and effective therapy is such that it is life-altering in a way that cannot be described with any patient-reported outcome or clinician-reported outcome. Um, and I, you know, so I don't think that that's going to be the biggest issue. Uh, there's going to be some stress over it, but I think when patients do very well, um, ultimately the proof's in the pudding. Uh, and I do want to mention that uh, although, you know, the theoretical having a great drug and, you know, what that means to families, which is undoubtedly a, a positive effect, but the stress of the cost of the medication is one thing, but it's, it's even more to have the stress of access. And that's, again, a discussion for policy. But, you know, one of the most heartbreaking things that we do is to know that there are effective medications that are out there that patients just can't get. All right. And we will absolutely get to that. Good. Okay. Let's go ahead and vote on this question, please, on the effect of this group on caregiver's quality of life. This group of treatments. All right. Okay, six minor positive and seven major positive. Great. Next voting question is one we ask every time and that is whether this, whether the treatment or this group of treatments in this case whether they have a particular effect on society's goal of reducing health inequities. So again, you can imagine this is, could be from treating a condition that is highly prevalent, more prevalent in a, in a population or a community um, that has suffered health inequity. It could be something about the mechanism of, of delivery that make it easier for certain people who've been underserved or disadvantaged to access it, um, et cetera. So, Anybody, Jason, go ahead. Would you like to have a comment or question about this? Yeah, I really wanted to ask Dr. Silverberg, who's on the clinical expert call prior to the meeting, spoke a bit about um, um, some diagnostic challenges, particularly for patients with more pigmented skin and how that can lead to underdiagnosis and undertreatment. I was curious if he would say a bit more about that and, and offer some thoughts about whether um, these new drugs could, could make a difference in those, those broader issues about, about underdiagnosis or even misdiagnosis. Sure. I think I'll keep it as brief as possible, just because I know we're up against the clock. I, I think, you know, there's there, there are definitely major um, differences by race and ethnicity um, in the U.S. in terms of outcomes with atopic dermatitis. Now, a large part of that, of course, is access. So I'm going to ignore that for now and save that for the policy discussion. But then there are issues that come up in terms of practice gaps um, that are very big obstacles. Um, most of our literature has been dominated by, you know, uh, KOLs in the field who from Germany and Denmark and 
where they traditionally have seen less diverse patient populations. We've had less education around how to properly address um, you know, darker skin types. What In the field of dermatology, we use the term skin of color. Um, and, uh, and that's led to definite issues. So we had patients who um, were told that they had psychogenic itch, that they were crazy, who were literally erythrodermic, but they were um, African-American patient that was just completely mis mis you know, assessed and underappreciated in severity. So we definitely have um, you know, greater need for uh, educational awareness around proper assessment in the field across diverse subtypes. Uh, you know, look, if, if you don't recognize that a patient is moderate to severe, you're not going to think about drugs that are approved for moderate to severe disease. It's that simple. Um, but assuming that the patient is properly um, identified and the decision to step up therapy is made, whether that's a non steroidal topical like ruxolitinib, whether that's, you know, the JAX or a trelokinumab or whatever, um, we have seen post hoc analyses, at least for all those drugs that they work reasonably well or uh, fairly comparable across those diverse patient subsets. Um, but, but, but this is a much broader conversation than, than just these individual drugs. Great, thank you very much. Any other questions about this? All right, let's go ahead and vote please on the effects of these, this group of drugs on society's goal of reducing health inequities from major negative effect through no difference up to major positive effect. Okay, we're just waiting for one more. All right, now we have them. Okay, we've got uh, seven, no difference, four minor positive, and one for minor negative and major positive. Okay, great. Now we're gonna ask about, um, in a sense, the mechanism or the, the method of administration, I should say. What are the relative effects of the JAK inhibitors as a class versus dupilumab on patients' ability to manage and sustain the treatment given the complexities of the regimens? So this question is meant to capture the potential other benefit. If two drugs are exactly the same in their effectiveness, but we think that there might be some added benefit of the way a new drug is delivered, or maybe it's a, it's a disadvantage of the way a new drug is delivered in the way that it can help patients manage their, their treatments. Um, and this depends on our knowing a little bit about how difficult it is for patients to manage uh, dupilumab versus the orals coming in. So clinical experts, you're probably gonna be our leading guide on this. Um, what is your experience with the diversity of patients and whether you think having oral options is going to have a major negative to major positive effect on their ability to manage their condition? Uh, my, my opinion is you can't just take, you know, small aspects of each drug class and that it's incredibly important to have more than one. You know, I think about an oral drug like or, or the class of JAK inhibitors as being something in the long term that's probably going to be used, you know, as a short get you clear type of a, an approach, an easy thing to start patients out with, but it's probably not gonna be a long-term treatment. Whereas dupilumab is a slower onset, uh, a type of a medication that potentially has much more benefit for long-term management. So, you know, they both have their, their uh, uh, advantages and they both have their disadvantages. And the real importance is to have, you know, multiple things to choose from when, you know, having a toolbox that's gonna accommodate that. And I can't, under stress the importance of supporting new drug development because any negative impact on any particular drug or any particular drug class is going to have a big benefit, not a big benefit, a big impact on uh, interest in general in the whole disease process. And so we're thrilled in the last 15 years to actually have options other than topical corticosteroids. And it's, it's really a, it's a new world in terms of being able to, you know, look forward to having better things to to use for treatment. But uh, prior to that, the black box warning that was put on the topical calcineurin inhibitors absolutely slammed the door shut for new drug development for this whole disease um, class. And so it's, it's important, I think, to take all that into consideration when you're thinking about saying positive or negative things about any of these drugs. Yeah, I, I would agree with Elaine. I would also add, you know, our current, the only approved option right now for systemic therapy is uh, dupilumab which is an injection and it's an injection every other week. 
um, or every four weeks, depending on the age group. Um, you know, there are some patients who are truly needle phobic and have nothing right now that they can use. Um, there are patients who, um, even if they're not needle phobic, when given the choice between an oral option and an injectable, there is a clear preference. And I think all the market research shows that. And we see that across all diseases that most patients prefer orals over injectables. Um, so I think this is, you know, the potential for, again, regardless of the, the MOA, but just having an oral approved option is incredibly valuable to us to offer to patients. I think there's an additional component here, which is we keep talking about these, um, these drugs or these patient populations as if they're monolithic uh, and they're not, they're, they're very complicated in many respects. And Elaine was alluding to some of this, you know, we use biologics indefinitely. Uh, it's for patients who have lifelong chronic disease where there's probably no hope, you know, it's gonna take years to clear them and maybe get them off drug. And sometimes they never get off drug. But atopic dermatitis is different than even psoriasis in some respects, and certainly different than rheumatoid arthritis and other more progressive disorders. There's this highly variable waxing and waning course that can happen in a subset of patients. It's not everybody, but in a subset. And that's just not a biologic patient. You would never think of using a biologic and treating 12 months of the year to control one or two months of active disease. And so that's also part of moderate to severe disease with inadequate response to topical therapy. And we have nothing approved for those patients right now. So even if you don't see the JAK inhibitors as a replacement uh, or substitute for, for the biologics, it's still going to, to tailor, be usable to tailor therapy to a whole different subset of patients that is right now missed entirely by biologics. Thanks. All right, so we're gonna vote here on the relative effects of the JAK inhibitors as a class versus dupilumab <clears throat> on patients' ability to manage and sustain their treatment given the complexities of the regimens, the relative complexities of the regimens. Here we are obviously talking about <clears throat> where they do compare to uh, dupilumab, where they are, I should say, kind of uh, targeted towards the moderate to severe. So if you can go ahead and vote from major negative effect of them as a class to major positive. All right. Okay, so we've got four no difference, D, uh, sorry, eight minor positive and one major positive. Great, one last vote of this type before we move to the value votes. <clears throat> and this, because trelukinumab and dupilumab have different potential dosing uh, regimens. Um, the question here is what are the relevant effects of trelekinumab versus dupilumab on patient's ability to manage and sustain treatment given the complexities of the regimens? Steve, can you just remind the, the CPAC again what the dosing issue is there that could potentially give trelekinumab um, a potential positive effect? Sure, so um, as mentioned, uh, dupilumab is in every two week uh, for adults. Um, uh, in a, comments from the manufacturer of uh, trilokinumab, they emphasize some data saying that among individuals who have a uh, response um, to trilokinumab given every uh, two weeks, they then randomize them to continuing on that dose or then decreasing the dose to every four weeks. And what they showed was that for many of the individuals they continued to maintain the response seen at, a, um, at that uh, every four week dosing. Of note, there were individuals who did have a worsening of disease, but, um, uh, uh, but as a group uh, effect, it was a small decrement. Okay, so we're not talking about oral versus injection, we're talking about the possibility of shifting to a less frequent injection. Anything from major negative effect to major positive effect. I think we should go ahead and vote on this so we have plenty of time for the value vote. I have a question, uh, Steve. Uh, okay. One of the experts before mentioned that even uh, the pilumab is uh, usually every four weeks. Uh, is that the case? Uh, or I misheard? 
Labeled, labeled use is every other week, but there's lots of data, emerging mounting data about uh, efficacy long-term and using it uh, as infrequently as once a month. There's not really data of less frequent than that, to my knowledge. Yeah, so so what I, I was the one who had mentioned that what I was referring to is in the uh, youngest pediatric age group approved right now, ages 6 to 11, if they're under uh, 30 kilos, in the 15 to 30 kilo range, the FDA approved dose was to give the adult dose, but of 300 milligram maintenance, but every four weeks. So that's what I was referring to. Uh, to Elaine's point, there is one study that was done, the solo continue study, that uh, which was a re-randomization from solo one, solo two in the adult monotherapy study um, that did look at um, less frequent dosing and found that um, there was a loss of efficacy with less frequent dosing. And so the, the, the general recommendation is maintain Q2 weeks that is the on-label dose. If I try to get Q4 weeks covered for dupilumab right now, I will get shut down by every payer because it will be considered as off-label. Thank you very much. All right, let's go ahead and vote on this then, please. Relative effects of trilitinumab and what you know about its dosing versus dupilumab. Okay. Eight, no difference, five minor positive. All right, super, into the home stretch. All right, so now we're talking about, if you will, the big picture long-term value for money, next slide. And so given today's available evidence on comparative effectiveness and incremental cost effectiveness, and considering the other benefits, disadvantages and contextual considerations we've just gone through, what is your judgment of the long-term value for money of treatment with baricitinib versus usual care? We're gonna vote on the two new um, potential agents that have prices um, because they have been priced for other indications. The first will be baricitinib. And I would like to ask um, uh, Lizzie Brower if she would like to just remind the, the panel again of what the cost effectiveness results were for baricitinib. Sure, um, let me just pull that up. Um, for baricitinib, the cost effectiveness, um, it was $71,000 per quality gained. Um, yep. Right. And the, uh, just for people who sometimes ask, the annual estimated net price was, I believe it was 19000 and change. Um, 19, where is it? It's <laughs> somewhere in here. $19,400. So that's its annual estimated net price. The cost effectiveness is $71,600 per quality. And again, you're asked to integrate these other uh, features as well. Any questions about how you're thinking about putting this together? The cost effectiveness piece, the other pieces that we've discussed? Anybody want to offer a comment on how they're going to vote and they want other people to think the way they do? Tara? I actually just had a question that we didn't get to um, in the last round, which is an overall question about value for these treatments. So I thought it was great that um, you presented the cost consequence analysis so showing the different impacts on different patient reported outcomes. But just following up with Austin's comment earlier, it wasn't clear to me what how to interpret these impacts. So I have two questions. First, it wasn't clear to me how to interpret these impacts because, you know, was the range from one to 10, was it from one to a hundred? You know, it wasn't clear what the range was for these scores. Um, and so that's my first question. My second question is that in order to really understand how much we should be weighing these patient reported outcomes, it would be helpful to know what the evidence is in terms of how responsive the utility instruments that were used were to these um, patient reported outcomes. So if the utility instruments are already very responsive to these outcomes, then we don't need to weight these as heavily. If they are not, then we should be looking at these with, you know, in more detail to really understand this additional impact. So those are, I guess, two separate but related questions. 
Yes, and I'll, I'll go ahead. I, I can take a, a stab at it. Um, it the cost consequence analysis that we presented is very limited and that's based on limited um, data from the manufacturers. So we really only had it for two drugs and it's therefore difficult to draw any um, conclusions from that analysis. Um, I will say that when we were deciding on how to present utility in the model, we did not find any evidence that the utility as captured by um, quality adjusted life years was different than what was reported by the patient reported outcomes in that um, looking at the data, they appeared to go in the same direction and by the same magnitude um, and did not, there was no um, evidence that we should be using utility different across drugs because they captured different um, elements like sleep or itch differently. Let, let me go a little further with that, uh, Lizzie. Um, so we had this question in part because it was raised both by manufacturers and occasionally by experts about whether, for instance, the JAK inhibitors reduced itch more than they reduced rash. And so we, were, we, had, we had good linkage between easy scores, easy 50, easy 75, easy 90, and quality of life that, that had been studied in real patients. But if those measures of quality of life, which were based on extent of lesions, didn't correlate with reduction in itch or improvement in sleep, there'd be a problem. And as best we could tell, they did correlate pretty well on average, not that there weren't individual patients who might get more reduction in itch than they got improvement in rash, but as best we could tell on average, the improvement in easy score predicted the improvement in itch, predicted the improvement in sleep. And we had utilities which should have captured all of those things. They weren't limited to just rash. We were looking at the patient's report of utilities in those different easy categories. The one thing I would mention though, is that with the JAK inhibitors, the itch reduction seems to happen really fast. And so, you know, we're mostly basing these on 16 week or 12 week analyses, but the JAK inhibitors seem to improve itch faster than that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I know Chris, you had a question. Did it get answered, I think? Okay, great. Okay, why don't we go ahead and vote on baricitinib's um, overall long-term value for money. Um, at current prices, and you can go ahead and vote A. Just remember the directionality here. A is low value, B is intermediate, and C is high value. Okay, and show the results. Okay, we've got seven intermediate long-term value for money and six high value, good. Let's go to the next question where we have the same setup for UPA to sit nib. So Lizzie, again, if you can just reflect on the, uh, the annual cost, the cost effectiveness, and then we'll turn to other questions about the broader aspects of value. Sure, and just to orient folks, the, this is in table 15 of your evidence packet um, for UPA to sit nib. Um, the cost per quality gained is approximately $248,000. Okay. Um, I know some people, the annual net price is 63,000. As she said, the cost per quality is 248,000. Um, and that's the cost effectiveness. And I guess you could say the cost side. Um, and we've again had a good discussion about the potential other benefits, disadvantages, et cetera. Um, does anybody want to raise any specific questions about upadacitinib um, in the context of their thinking of the overall value? Okay. We've had great discussions. Let's go ahead and vote then. A is low value, B is intermediate, and C is high.
Okay, we've got 10 low long-term value and three intermediates. All right. Since we have just about five, 10 minutes before we were gonna take our break for lunch, um, thank you for these votes. Um, I think we had really good discussions heading into them around a lot of these different aspects of value, but just I wanted to have the chance to quickly reflect on the vote. If we go back to Barisitnib, um, there was a fair number of votes for intermediate value instead of high value, that, that was the split there. Does anybody who voted intermediate want to say why they voted intermediate value for baricitinib at its current price? Steve, I saw you unmask yourself. Yeah, I guess quickly just that its efficacy data was, um, was lessened and I, you know, I forgot the thresholds, but you know, for, you know, high value, I'd probably be thinking somewhere, you know, 50 K or less per quality. Is that because your view of the uncertainty and the clinical effectiveness with the unknown risks part of it, or is that what you were saying? No, just the comparative clinical effectiveness. Okay. Anybody want to have something else to add to the kind of discussion around why you would have voted intermediate or low for baricitinib? I mean, see, intermediate or high for baricitinib. Greg? I'll say I, I voted high, and the reason I was willing to go there was because we're, we're really dealing with people are comfortable, but that you Oops, I, Greg, I think we're losing you through your connection. Sorry. Now, now you're muted. It's still picking up through the earphones, I think, through the AirPods. Um, oh, now we can hear you. Um, how about that? Yes. OK. Um, what I was saying is I was willing to go high value here because um, what I've been hearing all day is that people aren't fighting against that there will be a step therapy, that we're reserving these agents for people who have failed other, other therapies. And we're actually going to have some observable experience as to whether the therapies are working. So while they're high cost, um, I, I was comfortable that there was more certainty that we're having an effect. Okay. So noted. Any other comments on people as they were thinking their way through that overall value vote between, at least for baricitinib, it was split pretty much between, I think exclusively between uh, intermediate and high. Oh, Austin, please, yes. Yeah, no, I, I moved uh, from what probably would have otherwise would have been intermediate to high based on our discussion of the contextual factors. I thought those uh, all nudged in the same direction, which was in the high value direction. So I, I ref that my vote reflected that. Okay. And I know the other vote on ubiquitinib, the, the cost effectiveness itself was uh, far above the usual thresholds that, are considered kind of standard cost-effective levels for the US. So I think that probably drove most of your votes. Is there anything else that somebody wanted to vote there? A few people did say it was intermediate value. Um, if you wanted to say why you, you voted that, um, despite the cost-effectiveness findings, that would be fine. Any other commentary you'd like to add? No, okay. Oh, sorry, Jonathan, you wanted to add something, even though you didn't, but I'll, I'll, t I'll, I'll accept it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I just, I find the, the exercise, you know, I, I get the point, but it's an interesting exercise because with rebates and with bundling that are a reality and are not going anywhere, um, you know, that, that if that was the actual paid price, then, you know, that's what you're essentially rating, but in reality, it's not. Um, and so it's interesting that you have the drug that has set the bar for efficacy in the field ranked far worse than a good drug, but a drug that is far less effective. So it, it's just an interesting how this theoretical exercise leads to just some interest, wonky results. Well, actually, we do use the net prices of rebates in the U.S. system. We have access to that. So these are not based just on the list price. These are after rebate discounted prices that we factor into our, our models. Sure, but I'm just, you know, with the assumption of bundling around Umira and other drugs, 
um, there's a there's a net change across the whole system that is that is going to occur that just can't be reflected here, and that's why each payer is going to make their own decisions. Um, so again, it's 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 a theoretical exercise, an interesting one, but it's just it may not reflect the reality. Well, we will definitely talk about the rebate wall and other realities that people uh, know can interfere with a, a kind of a pure value based approach um, when we come back from lunch. David, did you want to make a comment, or was that? I, I think that hit it. I would suggest again because the manufacturer of uh, upadacitinib felt that we didn't have a correct net price. I want to stress how many times we asked them to provide us with their average net price and remind everyone that Dupilumab in exactly the same situation told us their net price for the meeting and for the report and how helpful that was to everybody evaluating things. And so it's not impossible for a manufacturer to give us that information. All right, sounding like we're getting even more good material for our policy roundtable when we come back. All right, uh, we are setting um, history here by ending before the appointed hour for lunch, I think by five minutes, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. Yep, five minutes. Okay, we get five more minutes for lunch. We will reconvene at 1.40. There's nothing like an odd time picked out of the hat to meet back, but make it 1.40 and we will make sure that the CPAC is back. We'll welcome our policy roundtable. And after lunch, we are going to talk coverage. We're going to talk step therapy. We're going to talk guidelines. We're going to talk rebates. Um, so please come back and join us for that conversation at 1.40. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>